Okay, so we're going to move on now to hormonal contraceptives. Um, hormonal contraceptives you use either singular or some combination of hormones to suppress ovulation. Um, the most common types used are or combined oral contraceptives, abbreviated COCs. They suppress the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, which suppresses its accretion of FSH and LH that inhibits follicle maturity and ovulation. So these work by inhibiting ovulation. They also alter the maturation of the endometrium and they make the cervical mucus thicker. So they actually have three different um, effects. It is, there are sometimes patients who are concerned that hormonal contraceptives allow conception or allow fertilization, but not implantation. Um, that matters to some people. It is not an issue for others, but if your patient is concerned about that, then you can let them know that first the cervical mu mucus is thicker, so it's difficult for sperm to get through, but also these are intended to, and they usually suppress ovulation. So fertilization is unlikely. Oral contraceptives should be taken at the same time each day. If they're not, then a uh, fertilization is possible, then an ovulation is possible. Um, withdrawal bleeding occurs during the placebo week. So traditionally oral contraceptives have been given in uh, three week cycles. There's a cycle of three weeks and then there's a week of um, placebo pills just uh, so that the habit of taking the pill every day uh, remains in place. And um, during that week, the, the patient would have uh, withdrawal bleeding. If a dose is missed, the instructions vary according to the combination. So it's really important. Um, it's really important for the patient to understand what the, what the uh, instructions are if they miss a dose. If two doses are missed, they should use another type of contraception for the remainder of that cycle. And if they've had intercourse and realize they've missed two doses, then it may be simpler to use emergency contraception. We're gonna talk about emergency contraception and how it works later on. The drawbacks and the risk of hormonal, um, systemic hormonal contraception are blood clots, major one, thromboembolism. Um, they also can stimulate the growth of tumors that are dependent on estrogen. So that's some types of breast cancers and, um, and um, reproductive cancers. They suppress lactation. So if someone is trying to breastfeed a baby, then combined oral contraceptives may actually interfere with that. They're contraindicated with liver disease um, because they can worsen liver disease. They can cause migraine for some people. They can decrease, they, the effectiveness of the oral contraceptive can be decreased by certain medications, some anticonvulsants, some systemic antifungal medications, antituberculous drugs, and protease inhibitors. So there are some meds that are going to make oral contraceptives less effective. So maybe a different method would be a better option for those women. Um, it's really common for women who've taken oral contraceptives, especially long-term, to have decreased fertility temporarily after stopping. The failure rate with perfect use is 0.3%. That's very low. Um, very few women taking oral contraceptives exactly as are prescribed, not taking any meds that, um, that decrease the effectiveness, not missing doses, very few women who take oral contraceptives under those conditions are going to get pregnant. However, patients are human. And so typical use, the failure rate's about 7%, which is still um, you know, less, less than one out of 10. So it's still relatively low. There are different types of combined oral contraceptives, okay? They're monophasic, means there's one type of pill that's taken throughout the entire cycle. It has the same ratio of estrogen to progesterone, or to progestin. Biphasic, there is a fixed estrogen dose, the same dose of estrogen is taken throughout the cycle, but the progestin dose varies. This promotes a more normal menstrual pattern. Triphasic has 
uh, low doses of both hormones and both of them vary throughout the cycle. Um, this more closely mimics a typical cycle while still suppressing ovulation and it has fewer side effects. More recently, um, we've learned that it's not necessary to menstruate every month uh, for health. And so uh, more and more uh, women are choosing extended cycle uh, oral contraceptives. This decreases the number of placebo pill days. Um, the placebo can be skipped for up to 84 days. And then so uh, there's like a three months with no period and then um, six days of, of placebo, or they eliminate placebo days altogether and just continuously take combined oral contraceptives. So there are some some um, COC options that are extended uh, and those are also safe. Another oral contraceptive option is progestin only. This is less, of, less effective than combined oral contraceptives, but it decreases the risk of the estrogen. So it lowers the risk of blood clots um, somewhat. It also lowers the risk of suppressing lactation. So this is called the mini pill. Uh, or the progestin only pill. Um, one of the risks is that it's much less effective at preventing ovulation, so failure is more common. If it is taken three hours late, then a backup method needs to be used for the rest of that cycle. So this has to be taken very, very consistently, same time every day. Uh, most oral contraceptives work similarly. They use similar hormones but the, the delivery methods are what changes. So another delivery option is a transdermal. Transdermal contraceptives, a patch is placed weekly on the same day for three weeks, and then no patch for one week during which withdrawal bleeding occurs. Um, this delivers a continuous level of progesterone and ethanol estradiol. Okay, so same general hormones, different formulation, different, um, method of administration, different route. The risk, again, thromboembolism, it stimulates the growth of, growth of estrogen dependent tumors. It can suppress lactation, contraindicated with liver disease, can cause migraines for some people. And the same meds are going to decrease the effectiveness because it's the same hormones. The delivery method is just different. Failure rate with typical use, again, is 7%. Perfect use, about 0.3%. The vaginal contraceptive ring, um, one brand that you're probably familiar with is NuvaRing, um, delivers continuous levels of progesterone and ethanol estradiol. One ring is placed and worn for three weeks, and then one week of no ring with um, for, for the next week, no ring is used and withdrawal bleeding occurs. These are one size fits all, they're self-inserted. So let's look at what this looks like. This is gonna be placed similar to a diaphragm or female condom. This ring is flexible, so it can be folded um, or bent, squished down, and it's placed, and it's placed in the same location as that diaphragm ring. And it's left in place for a week, changed out once a week, every, after three weeks, um, you go without for a week and then start that cycle over. Okay. Um, it has very similar risk uh, to all of the other methods. Uh, all the other hormonal methods, very similar risk and very similar um, effectiveness rates. Injectable contraception, uh, depo progesterone. You do not have to be able to pronounce or spell this. You need to know this is uh, depo, okay? Um, it's given sub Q or IM. The initial dose should be in the first five days of the menstrual cycle. So remember the menstrual cycle starts with day one of bleeding. So any time within five days of the onset of bleeding, um, the first dose should be given. It's repeated every 11 to 13 weeks. So there's a window that it, in which it can be repeated. Or yes, there's a window in which you need to administer it. 
it can be administered postpartum. So frequently women who are going to use Depo as their primary me method of um, birth control after delivery are gonna get that first Depo shot before they even leave the hospital. It's less likely to impair lactation than combined hormonal contraception. Um, the risk and drawbacks, it tends to decrease bone mineral density. It's actually not recommended for adolescents because during adolescence this is the last chance we have to build bone and we start losing bone after we're fully grown. And so giving Depo in adolescence can actually uh, contribute to lower bone density. Um, the trade-off is that it's pretty effective. And so it's been given to a lot of adolescents just because they, um, the concern is that they might be less likely to be consistent with other methods. Um, it's also caught, cause, it tends to cause weight gain, lipid changes, um, thromboembolism is still a risk, uh, irregular bleeding and spotting, decreased libido and breast changes. The failure rate with typical use is 4% and with perfect use is 0.2%. Uh, if this is an injection, what is typical use versus perfect use? Um, when this fails, it is almost always because that person missed the window to go, go in and get their next uh, injection. Depo has to be given as an injection, so it's going to generally have to be given in a um, clinic setting or medical setting. So what does that mean for patients who have work schedules that make it difficult to get to um, the clinic or who have school schedules that make it difficult to get to the clinic or transportation issues or just clinics that are so overwhelmed they cannot get patients in in that 11 to 13 week um, window. The most common failures for these, someone misses their appointment or doesn't have an appointment and by the time they get in, they're already pregnant. So one of the drawbacks is that women with barriers to getting to a, med a medical appointment consistently are going to be at greater risk for failure for this uh, contraceptive. Implantable contraceptives, uh, biodegradable tubes or rods are placed under the skin on the arm. They continually re release progestin for at least three years. This prevents some but not all ovulation, but it also thickens the cervical mucus. Um, so it's much, much less likely that sperm are going to get through um, in the first place. The single rod version can be inserted immediately postpartum. The risk and drawbacks of this, it, they can cause irregular bleeding or spotting. And sometimes that can be very frustrating. Uh, there's nothing that can be adjusted. It, you just have to wait and see if it gets better. Headache, nausea, nervousness, skin changes, vertigo. It does require a minor surgery to both implant and remove them. Once it's in place, the failure rate is 0.1% until it's um, removed. They typically um, are good for three to five years, depending on the brand. And I'm going to show you a picture of what this looks like and about where it would be placed. So this is the size of that rod and it's placed usually around here on the arm. Once that heals, it's barely noticeable and then it just needs to be removed when that uh, woman is ready to have it removed. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about in the hormonal section is emergency contraception. This is the morning after pill. And it's really important, first of all, that you understand this is different from the abortion pill, um, which we're going to talk about in a few in another section. Okay, emergency contraception is not the same thing as an abortion pill. Emergency contraception is protection against pregnancy after intercourse occurs. Um, it's done by using various combinations of oral contraceptives. There are pills now that have the specific combination and it's sold as a package as an emergency contraception or plan B, um, but there also are providers who will just instruct patients, take this many of this pill from your pack. <clears throat> um, it can also be done by immediate insertion of a copper IUD. Emergency contraception is usually offered after sexual assault. Um, but it also is available over the counter in a lot of um, locations 
there are states that have tried to make that less available and I'm uh, not completely sure about whether it's available over the counter in all states at this point. Um, but it's, it's available over the counter in some places or behind the counter, you have to ask the pharmacist. Um, if it's taken before ovulation, it prevents ovulation, okay? This is the primary mechanism of action. Now, people have a really hard time understanding how it is not an abortion because they, we tend to have a, an idea of intercourse and fertilization as taking place simultaneously. That fertilization occurs immediately um, after intercourse, okay? That's really not the case most of the time. Remember that window of fertility. Remember that sperm can actually live in the female reproductive act for several days. I'm sorry, the reproductive tract for several days. Um, and so if ovulation occurs anytime during that window when sperm are present, then if we can prevent that ovulation, we can prevent fertilization. That's the primary mechanism of action for hormonal emergency contraception. I cannot speak to the mechanism of action for the copper IUD. Um, copper is spermicidal um, and also makes the um, endometrium um, um, hostile. So it doesn't allow implantation, but it also um, is spermicidal. So any sperm remaining in the uterus are going to be damaged by the placement of the copper IUD. So if hormonal EC is taken after ovulation, it has very little effect on the hormones or the endometrium. So it is unlikely to prevent implantation if ovulation has already occurred. So it has a high failure rate because it's not intended to be a routine method of contraception. It drastically decreases the risk of pregnancy by preventing ovulation if it has not already occurred, okay? Um, the availability varies by state. Some states have laws that allow pharmacists to refuse to sell emergency contraception. Um, even with a prescription, some, some versions are available over the counter to women um, over age 17. It is most effective if it's taken before 72 hours. And that's because the goal is to prevent ovulation. And if we don't prevent ovulation, it's probably not gonna do anything. Um, there's some decrease in the risk of pregnancy if it's taken between 72 and 120 hours. So if it's been more than 72 hours, it might still be worth taking it, but it's gonna have be less effective. It's most effective taken the first 72 hours. Um, the risk and benefits or the risk versus benefits, um, it's recommended that people take an over-the-counter antiemetic when they take EC because it tends to cause a pretty severe nausea and vomiting for some women. Um, the major risk is failure. If the person has not menstruated in 21 days after using EC, they should be evaluated for pregnancy. It's contraindicated in pregnancy or an undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. So if they're pregnant or might be pregnant, they should not be taking it. It does not disturb an implanted pregnancy. It will not typically cause a miscarriage if the pregnancy is already implanted. Um, women, this is one of the major things. Women who use EC, need to use a reliable form of birth control until a reliable backup, probably a barrier, until they've completed a, the, that cycle because ovulation may occur unexpectedly. Remember, we don't prevent ovulation completely, it just delays it. So if a person has um, intercourse or is assaulted on say, um, day 10 of their menstrual cycle. They take EC. They would have normally ovulated on day 14. It may delay that ovulation until day 18. And then if they may think they're in a safe time period and have unprotected intercourse, they could get pregnant. 
So when we move ovulation, that person needs to, uh, to be taking an, uh, or using an alternate method of birth control until their cycle is, uh, um, is completed. Um, the effectiveness, this reduces the risk of pregnancy by 75%. This is hormonal EC. The copper IUD can be as high as 99%. Okay, that is the end of this section. The next thing we're going to talk about is IUDs.